everyone, I'm Zoya Hassan, an under 30 reporter at Forbes. We're backstage here at the Under 30 Summit today with Arturo Elizondo, who's the CEO and co-founder of The Avery Company. He's also a speaker at the summit today. Arturo, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, why don't you start us off with telling us a bit about what exactly it is that The Avery Company does? Yeah, um, I mean, at our core, we are a biotech company where we can make animal protein without using a single animal. And the way that we do that is we, we, we brew it. We, we, um, the way that we do that is that we brew it, similar to making beer and wine. Okay, amazing. And you sell these directly to businesses or directly to consumers? What's the model here? Yeah, so we're, we're a B2B company. And we work with awesome startups and younger companies, but we also work with some of the world's biggest food companies. And the companies that you're selling your products to, these proteins, are they typically like manufacturers of like vegan food or is it like all inclusive? Yeah, we actually specialize in non-vegan companies. So oh. companies that sell to everyone. Okay. Um, because ultimately, and, and part of the beauty of this technology is that they're, they're animal protein, so they have the taste, the texture, the aroma, the functionality, the foaming binding, but without having to use the water, the land, the energy, the supply chain risk, the salmonella. Um, and so really for us, um, our focus really is on how do we get the 99% of companies and consumers that are not vegan uh, or vegetarian to embrace, um, to not only embrace these, but like really, really um, get excited about these products. Yeah, because there's like a giant consumer base who like probably, you know, tries to go vegan here and there, yeah. but like they just can't do it. So did you have those sorts of consumers in your mind? Yeah, exactly. But also thinking about like the people who don't even know what vegan yeah. is, right? Like my, my mom, like when I think about the kind of company that we want to be and what our litmus test is, is like, can we get, you know, my mom in Texas, yeah. you know, my cousins in Mexico, like if they, um, if they buy these products and sometimes without even knowing, because ultimately as a B2B company, our goal is to be ubiquitous um, and work with the world's biggest food companies. And oftentimes eggs and, 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 and ingredients are not, you know, are, are not necessarily always the reasons why people buy, for example, a cake, mm -hmm. right, or a cookie or pastas or, or, or you know, wine. Um, but there are all of these ingredients that go, um, that go underneath that power those products mm -hmm. um, that we can ultimately enable. Yeah, and t take me back to the time when you were first, like, ideating this yeah. company. What motivated you to really, like, get into proteins that yeah. are, like, lab-grown? I... I was in Geneva, Switzerland, and I was, I thought I was going to work in government. I was trying to get into the UN and because I wanted to help do something good for the world in some shape or form, but I didn't know what that was, what, what that was going to look like. And then I read this article that with the headline, China doubles, it doubles its own meat consumption in less than 20 years. Okay. Um, and in the, in the article, there was this chart of GDP per capita on animal protein consumption with all the world's countries mapped. And there was also a one-to-one -one correlation. Um, and I realized that the appetite for animal protein goes beyond preferences. It's so cultural and it's so, you know, embedded in, in our psyche as, as, as a world um, that there was just not, I realized that there was not enough land or water to satiate that kind of demand. Yeah. And so I knew that there just, there had to be a way to fundamentally make protein at scale in a way that doesn't destroy the planet. Okay, amazing. And tell me, why the B2B model? Why not use these proteins, make your own products, yeah. sell those directly to the consumer? Why did you choose the B2B yeah. model? I wanted to have the the biggest impact I possibly could. And I thought, well, there are hundreds of companies that touch millions if not billions of people um, all over the world. And for us, our mission is how do we get high quality protein into the hands of every human in every corner of the earth, making it really accessible for people to, to, to eat products that are good for them and good for the planet. And so I knew that if we could 
instead be the intel inside and partner with the world's biggest food companies it's that was the fastest way for us to truly change the world yeah definitely and tell me what the fundraising journey was like because that that can be tricky <laughs> yeah i mean we are um what it was especially tricky because you know we're a hardcore R&D company. Like we spent the first 6 years developing the core technology without any revenue. You know without any sales like we were just proving can you actually get a yeast to make animal protein better than a chicken? Like that was a question that we were trying to answer. Um, and and so it, it was a little it was tricky um, but we've been very fortunate um, in large part because we've been able to attract investors that don't see this as a 3 to 5 year mm -hmm. um time horizon but really is that they want to build generational companies that will fundamentally change the way that the world eats and that um and, and that's not going to be an overnight game you know this is not this is not software like we're making physical products that people are eating every single day um and so it's a different kind of mentality but we've been you know we started off with 50k $50,000 in cash um and 3 months of lab space from a company from an, a a VC fund called Indie Bio and since then we've raised over 240 million dollars um to build up the technology and really now start getting the getting approximately into the hands of consumers. Amazing. And speaking of, you know, that generational timeline you're talking about. Yeah. Is there anything exciting or new coming down the pipeline for the Ever company? Yeah. Um one of the things that I really think about is there's one area about you know what we know is how do we improve the products that are in the market today right how you know for example a lot of our products are around replacing eggs for baking and 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 um and cooking and other and other ingredient applications but really I think there's a lot of opportunity as well for how do we use this technology to blow people's minds to create products that are not a me too that it's not like oh we're trying to make the same thing mm -hmm. but that truly create a paradigm shift and we actually um we're about to launch this product oh, wow. uh this is the newest version um of of our of our product it comes from a protein in the egg but it has no eggy taste and no eggy smell but it's very high quality and so um it's really soluble and you can essentially add it and drizzle it drizzle it to almost you know any drink any soup coffee tea whatever product you want whatever you like to drink in the mornings and get your protein um without really having to think about it and what we really get excited about is how can we reimagine protein delivery altogether mm -hmm. that when people think about when when they ask the question where do you get your protein from the often times say meat you know um dairy or eggs or seafood but what if you could get it in your morning coffee every morning mm -hmm. what if you could get your protein in your smoothies and your ice cream um and your frappuccinos and so i'll um i'll I'll show you this is what we call our liquid gold okay it has over 10 grams of protein in this little packet but you can you can put up to 30 or 40 grams of protein in this and what does it taste like Um it's kind of like honey. Okay. It's and that's why we call it the gold. It has this so if you look at it. Uh Oh wow. It's it's Yeah, it's, it's a like, lot like a, honey. Yeah. It's like a Do you want to taste it? Okay, yeah. Mm. So this one has a little bit of lime juice. Um Good. and a little bit of monk fruit. Um and it's like this little honey that you can add to your oatmeal in the mornings mm -hmm. or to whatever and then boost it. So you don't have to think about where you're getting your protein that day. And it's completely animal free. Completely animal free. Okay. Wow. Um but it is real like protein. And would you ever consider selling this directly <laughs> to the consumers or any future products? We thought about it. Um right now we are I mean I just this product has to exist. Mm -hmm. And right now um we're talking to some really amazing companies in in launching it in a lot of different form factors so my hope is to say b2b as much as possible but ultimately you know um we may we may end up doing something like that in the future but okay. not not in the near future okay and you know tell me a little bit more about the company culture yeah. every who are you as a leader what are some of the values you live by 
um, you know, part of what I love about, you know, like I really try to embody our value, uh, our, our, our company name as Every. And what that means for me, um, especially as a Latino, mm -hmm. as an immigrant, um, as someone in the LGBTQ community, is how can we create a company where everyone can speak up, everyone can share their ideas. And, you know, I started the company when I was 22 years old. I knew nothing about what I was doing, but I, I had good ideas and I wanted to test them out. And my goal is to be able to have everyone at the company, whether you're the intern or the CTO, be able to ask and question our strategy. Why are we doing this? What if we did this? What if we did that? And I fundamentally believe that if we can have every voice heard, um, or at least everyone feel like they can share their perspective, that will ultimately lead to better outcomes. Um, and so that's really what I try to live by every day. Yeah, and you, you said you started the company at 22 years old. <laughs> You've obviously come a long way. You're yeah. speaking at the Under 30 Summit today. But tell me, what was one of the hardest decisions you've had to make to be where you are today? I, <laughs> I was scared of being a founder. Like, okay. I was scared of... I was scared of going into biotechnology, a field I knew nothing about. Um, and I was scared of being in Silicon Valley. You know, since I was little, I was like, I want to work in government. I want to change the world. And that's where I thought I was going to be able to do it. Um, and I realized that I was too impatient uh, for the pace of government. And I f realized how broken our food system was. And I called up a mentor um, and I was about to take a job in the Obama administration um, right after college. And I was so excited. And he was like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, w you should be in San Francisco, like creating like the future of food like you've been telling me for the last three years. You know, and I, I, and I, I thought, well, maybe I'll do it later. But when he told me that, I realized that I was, I was scared of taking that leap. And I was like, you know what, you're right. And so the next day I, I booked a woman ticket to San Francisco. I had no job, I had no place to stay, but I thought, you know what, like, I don't wanna be on my deathbed regretting it and asking myself, what if I had done it? Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that I booked that ticket. That is a wonderful story, and we are all glad that you took that <laughs> ticket. Thank you, Arturo, for being here today. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. <laughs>